committee for inviting me to speak today. Um, this topic of uh, diversity and gender inequality, it's very, very dear to me. Um, as a female academic academician, I've been very aware, you know, throughout my career of the variety of obstacles um, that uh, one will see uh, prominently in uh, as you go through your career. And uh, oftentimes those obstacles haven't been as problematic for my male colleagues. Um, and uh, those difficulties have been shared with uh, conversations that I've had with many of my female um, counterparts. Um, I believe that mentoring uh, pre-med students um, through multicultural diversity office while at Louisiana State University was so um, rewarding to me. And I continued to try to mentor as I came to OSU as well several years ago. Um, I, I noticed that it's, it's often very lacking uh, mentoring really throughout the career, starting early on and also through uh, more senior uh, career. So it's very important. Um, if we can go ahead and advance the slide. Um, I think you should be able to push the space bar. I so? Yeah. And I think I can't. I think you have to advance them. I'm sorry, I don't think I can do it on my end. I had sent them to you and I think they don't want me I, to share. I think okay. you're sh you're sh you're sharing it from I think OK, before. there we go. Maybe I can now. Oh. OK, there we go. So um, in 2020, um, I, along with several colleagues, um, authored an article on gender diversity in neurology and neurophysiology. And we're, in this article, we reviewed the challenges that are present and some of the potential solutions uh, that we uh, could come up with. Um, and although change really can happen very slowly, um, that year we saw some changes both in the um, uh, broader neurology uh, um, academy and also in the smaller society uh, where women have gained some leadership uh, roles. Uh, but it's a struggle and we continue to return to the question of why change takes so long to occur. So, um, you know, in general, people have a difficult time handling diversity. Um, we are comfortable with uh, with people who are similar to ourselves and we're not so comfortable with those who are different than us. Um, and uh, there's just must been much research as to why this is and it's important as it relates to the whole topic of gender diversity in medicine. Um, gender diversity in medicine mimics in large part gender diversity in a broader population. Um, it's just difficult to achieve uh, diversity for a variety of reasons. So we all know that time and resources are limited um, at the institutional level. Uh, and for each of us in our daily lives, uh, resources are limited to time is limited. So if we're going to spend the time and the resources evaluating and discussing and trying to solve the problem of gender inequality, we have to ask, why does diversity matter? And why is it important at all? Well, there was a very a well uh, known article in the Harvard Business Review in 2016 entitled Why Diverse Teams Are Smarter. Um, and researchers evaluated the outcomes and the performance metrics of diverse business teams. And many of these same principles that they came across with apply to the medical field as well. What they found was that diverse teams perform better because the participants are more aware of their own biases. They tend to be more open to other perspectives and they, therefore they question the prior assumptions that they have. They tend to be more willing to engage with others, seeing other viewpoints, and they become competitive with each other and they create a more creative and innovative enhancing performance team. So diversity matters and research has shown us that diversity in a team improves networking, improves communication and engagement. We're more likely also to promote those we know and have engaged with. So suddenly that person who's not like us becomes a little less intimidating when we engage with them. 
and it improves the creativity as different perspectives enhance ideas and approaches to problem solving. Problem solving is the basis for innovation as the need for a new device, a new method, sparks a way to provide that new method or that new device. An example of the diversity enhancement is what's happened at several Fortune 500 companies over the years, where adding qualified females to the executive board has been shown to enhance performance and result in greater financial gains for those institutions. The 2015 McKinsey report looked at 366 public companies in the top quartile for ethnic and racial diversity in management in their companies were 35% more likely to have financial returns above their industry mean. Companies that were in the top quartile for gender diversity were 15% more likely to have returns above the industry mean. And an analysis by Credit Suisse of 2,400 companies found that organizations with at least one female board member yielded higher returns on equity and a higher net income growth than those that did not have any woman on the board. And we know that additional research of non-homogeneous teams challenge workers to think creatively and with other perspectives and improve their performance. So we know that diversity at Fortune 500 companies improves financial gains and performance, but how about medicine? Is medicine different? Well, how does this translate to medicine in general? How can significant gender disparity in medicine be improved? So we know that there are some contributors that are prominent in gender diversity and gender disparity in medicine. We know that women leave academic medicine at a higher rate than men do. Can any of us guess what the most frequent reasons cited in surveys of females in medicine as to why they leave? We'll come back to that maybe later. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other contributors. So academic culture often fails to support women in medicine. Often meetings are held early in the morning or late in the evening when it infringes on family time and childcare responsibilities, often biasing against women physicians who are still mostly responsible for those sorts of responsibilities in large part. And in addition, there's an unintended bias where women are not asked to be part of a group or they're looked over. It's akin to being invited for dessert when everyone else is being invited for dinner. Um, and there's a wide disparity in gender compensation, and we'll touch on that a little bit later too. There's also a lack of career mentorship, not having mentors who are similar in their life or situational experiences doesn't allow for effective mentoring. So I've touched upon briefly the lack of support in our academic culture, but home or childcare responsibilities often fail fall to women and they fail to create an environment in which women are able to succeed. They create disparities in gender advancement. So let's look at academic culture first as a contributor to gender disparity. A significant component of the cultural difficulty in academia has to do with implicit bias. So implicit bias has for the most part replaced explicit bias in the workplace, although there's sure to be still instances of explicit bias. Implicit bias by definition is an attitude or a stereotype that affects our understanding, our actions and our decisions in an unconscious manner. So when we speak of biases toward women in medicine, we mean implicit bias generally is at play. Does explicit bias still exist? Well, yes, it, it still does. And it's sad to say, but about 50% of women will still report on surveys that they've had some history of sexual bias or harassment in the workforce. And although it's illegal for the most part now in institutions, they find a way to ask about a spouse or children or to gauge whether children may be in their near future when hiring and promoting. 
and that sets up a gender bias. I recently sat at a leadership meeting where that came up. In 2018, the University of Maryland Medical School was sued over sexual harassment that had occurred over many years duration and had been reported and ignored for several years. And that's just 2018. So there was a nice study in 2020 last year from Balmer and colleagues that described their research on women in an academic institution in 2018 and how the theory of gendered organizations could be applied to the experience of women in academic medicine and that to explain why gender equity remains difficult to resolve. They described a system in which formal gender diversity programs existed, but they weren't fully implemented and they were given kind of lip service. So a system which was kind of stacked against them was often described by the woman in this study. The more senior women in academics would try to navigate the system as best they could, and they try to advocate for some of the younger female colleagues. So what is the theory of gendered organizations? Well, the theory of gendered organizations is one in which formal expectations intended to create gender neutral are left intact, but informal interactions were experienced as inequitable contributing to the maintenance and reproduction of gender inequity. So it's sort of like lip service. Why are gendered organizations important to the concept of gender diversity and equity? Well, gendered organizations lack transparency and equity and compensation among males and females in the organization, although the organizations formally talk about gender equity. These organizations are more likely to place women physicians with similar qualifications as a male physician on a non-tenure track and male physicians on the tenure track. Gendered organizations are more likely to look at CVs with biases for promotion of women, suggesting maybe one or two more publications may be needed to move up on an academic rank. And the same bias is not applied to a male CV. In essence, these gendered organizations talk the talk, but without the action to back it up. Another contributor to gender disparity is the compensation gap. Looking at academic physician salaries from a survey in 2016, female physicians in academic medicine earned less than their male counterparts in every single field, except for radiology accounting for physician age, experience, faculty rank, specialty, scientific authorship, NIH funding, clinical trial participation, and Medicare reimbursements. According to the National Committee on Pay Equity, women across all professions working full-time earn 80.5 cents for every dollar earned by men. And for minority women, the gap is even greater. Data published in JAMA Internal Medicine in 2016 looked at over 10,000 physician faculty in 24 public medical schools. And they demonstrated that women had lower salaries than men and were less likely to be full professors even after adjusting for clinical and research productivity. This same article from JAMA shows a chart in which we see that the pay gap in public medical schools in 2016 between female and male physicians persisted across every single specialty listed here, except for radiology. According to the data in 2016, most public medical schools, female physicians were paid on average $20,000 less than their male counterparts each academic year. A female full professor's salary would be equivalent to a male associate professor. If we look at Medscape data of physician compensation in 2021, we look at primary care data for male physicians and on average earn almost $60,000 more yearly compared to women physicians. How about specialty care? 
Well, after additional years of fellowship training, does the gender gap improve in specialty care? Well, again, according to the 2021 Medscape Physician Compensation Report, the gap is actually even greater for specialists. Almost $100,000 more compensation for male specialists compared to women specialists in an academic year. Here we see a broader survey with increasing awareness of inequality and discrimination. Does the recent data indicate that the situation has improved for women? No. If we look at the data from the general US population survey, the median earnings in 2019 of men and women at various age groups, we see that for all age groups, men's median earnings are greater compared to women, placing women at a disadvantage for lifelong financial earnings, retirement, and for indebtedness later in life. Over the course of a career, if we think about the loss of lifetime earnings after 30 years of practice, it result in significant, significant loss and gap in earnings of female physicians compared to male, and females in general compared to males in the general workforce. An average woman will have lost over $400,000 in earnings because of this earnings gap over her career. So we have to ask ourselves, can't women just negotiate for higher pay? Well, research shows that women are reluctant to negotiate their salary. There's a cost to negotiation that most women are not willing to pay, and it's a social stigma cost of negotiating for themselves, and men don't seem to carry that stigma. Women who negotiate are more likely to be seen as aggressive, not part of the team, which is different than how men who negotiate for themselves are seen. Research shows that women do a better job of negotiating for others than they do for negotiating for themselves. Again, it goes back to that whole um, caring kind of uh, mentality or mindset that women have been almost raised to, to believe in. Another significant contributor to gender disparity is the lack of physician female mentors. So male physicians can certainly serve as mentors for female physicians. However, having a mentor who has had similar obstacles, who has had similar challenges, can help you maneuver through those challenges in your career is invaluable. Regardless of the specialty, there's increasingly less female physician role models at each level in the career path as one progresses compared to male physicians. Less full professors than there are associate professors, less associate professors than there are female assistant professors, and so on. So it means that there's less mentorship opportunities all along the way. It's difficult for junior female academicians to find mentors who are more senior female academicians, and they've navigated the system to learn from. In 2016, only 12% of internal medicine department chairs and 1% of surgical department chairs were women. Only 22% of surgical department professors were female. If we look at AMC data from 2020, and we look at this graph of the percentages of chairs at US medical school departments by gender, um, and if they are permanent or if they are interim, we can see that there's a large gap present between men and women department chairs, with women holding just close to 20% of department chair positions, which is an improvement from single digits in the 1990s, but we certainly can see we have a long way to go to achieve gender equity. Jaxi and colleagues in 2020 published in the Academy of Medicine report their data on the representation of women among membership and leaders of 30 national societies in medicine. And in their study, they looked at the membership and the number of leadership positions over a 15 year period held by a woman from 2000 to 2015. When we look at the data in 2020 from these subspecialty societies over this 15 year time span and across all specialties, we see that there's a lack 
of female physician leaders across the board. This mimics the article that we saw in the Academy of Medicine report. So in orthopedics, in urology, neurosurgery, thoracic surgery, and radiology, there's actually 0% representation of women elected officers as leaders in their specialty society. Why is leadership role in specialty society so important anyway? I mean, why do we look at that? Why, does, why is that a data point? Well, leadership positions in these specialties, sorry, in these specialties um, are important because they help gain access to networking opportunities and they improve the chances for promotion at their home institution. So they're important because there's something that looked at uh, when you're going out for promotion. And we can see that this is in this way, this lack of department chair positions correlates to the lack of promotion and the lack of, of, um, of, uh, of female physicians moving up the ranks to associate and to full professor. In a study by Trico and colleagues in 2020, they looked at global evidence of gender disparities in academic medicine. And they found that there was underrepresentation of women in multiple segments, including higher academic ranks, the number of courses that were taught, administration roles, recruitment offers, and promotional opportunities, as well as academic leadership opportunities. And all of this suggested that this is really a global problem, it's not a US problem. Another contributor to gender disparity is that of home responsibilities. Remember at the beginning of the session, I asked that question of what of the which of the contributors would be see, uh, seen in the survey as the most prominent. Well, it is home responsibilities. Um, early in their careers, about 40% of women tend to leave medicine uh, and they've ranked in surveys that the Home responsibilities and childcare responsibilities are the number one reason for leaving. Um, they leave the profession as a whole. Uh, they may return later after the children are older, uh, but it means that often they've lost the ability to advance at the same pace as males in their profession. They've lost the earnings from all of those years that they left, and they may be seen as less committed to the field and less likely to, to be promoted. But of course, there, there are exceptions. It definitely has an impact upon promotional ability. In a study of the internal medicine five-year survey of physician recipients of NIH, K08, and K23 awards, they found that among married or partnered recipients with children, women spent on average eight and a half more hours weekly on domestic activities compared to their male counterparts. And these are academicians who have received NIH awards. So they're very highly competitive awards and they are very highly committed to the profession, but yet they're spending a majority of their time on household duties that their male counterparts aren't. The same respondents were more likely to take time off during childcare disruptions than the men were. So what is the solution to this? The solution lies in fixing the system, not fixing the female position. We have to look at the obstacles that are present and make the system equitable for all. There are numerous recommendations that exist, but they need to be implemented. It's not just talking the talk, but actually placing these into action. So what are the solutions? Here are some potential solutions to improve gender disparity. First, creating a well-defined or streamlined process for hiring and promoting with women physicians included in equal numbers in the decision-making teams. When women are on the hiring team, it's much more likely that women will be recruited among the pool of qualified applicants. Faculty, grand rounds, and staff meetings should be held during working hours rather than early morning or evening to allow for family time and childcare responsibilities. One should ensure that there's adequate numbers of career mentoring along all stages of the career path with both female and male role models at each level. And one has to monitor the gap in gender and divisions and departments to ensure that there's continuous improvement, not to place uh, some um, gender diversity initiatives in place and then not to monitor them. Provide transparency in salary 
and hiring practices to avoid to avoid that continuation and widening of that compensation gap that I showed in the charts. And other solutions include allowing for flex time and shared work schedules and allowing for some part time work models as well. So this is a nice pictorial here um, that was in the women's health issue in 2017 of what's needed to fix the system. And you can see there's multi, it's multifaceted. Um, so training and unconscious bias for all faculty members is a first solution, but it's only beginning and it allows for awareness. Women academicians and other minorities need career and developmental mentoring to learn the skills that are needed for career advancement and promotion at their institution and the mentoring process, and it should continue really throughout one's career. Even, did I lose that? There's even um, uh, bias that occurs later in the uh, careers of, of women academicians. In addition, search committees for faculty, division, and department leaders, as well as university and hospital leadership, need to indicate that there's equal ratios of male and female members. Opportunities for networking need to be gender neutral, and meetings required for faculty or meetings which enhance networking should be during working hours and not early in the morning or in the evenings when family obligations would pose a challenge for childcare. And changes to improve mentorship and career advancement need to be tracked at the department, the hospital, and the university level to allow for accountability. If you don't track it and you don't keep records of it, then you're, you're not holding anything accountable. Um, and needed to have policy changes to provide a truly equitable and a diverse culture for the academic enhancement of all physicians, not just males, but all physicians. All right, that's all I had for now, so thank you very much for your time and attention and I want to open it up to any questions. This is Felicia Duncan. Hi, Duncan. Uh, thank you so much again for um, coming and uh, you know uh, giving this talk. You know, like Christina said, um, it's one that um, was missing from our archives, and we really appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, your opinion on something. So I remember last year, um, or early this year, I read an article um, that says, you know, when uh, when a specialty becomes women's work, becomes a woman's work. Basically, what the article showed was that. I'm sorry, you're breaking up, Dr. Duncan. I can't hear you very well. I think there's some background noise or. Would it be best if I type? Um, maybe uh, you're breaking up. I, I didn't get the last part of what you said. Um, there was an article that mentioned um, Specialties that are predominantly women actually have lower pay than those specialties that are predominantly male, which, you know, goes to show when you said we need to fix the system that speaks, you know, clearly to that point. Yes. Um, and you mentioned, you know, um, importantly that we need to have male uh, role models for or um, female physicians. Now, do you have any thoughts about how we can, you know, encourage um, the males in this, the, these fields that are mo mostly women to attract more males to the field because, you know, I, I would assume not only the males are kind of discouraged, but also other females from, you know, entering those fields when they notice this pay gap. Right. And I think that's really what, what it touches upon. It's, it's often the compensation um, that males will have a tendency to go towards more of the highly compensated fields. So the surgical fields um, uh, are the ones that are mostly predominantly male versus the, you know, the, the uh, fields like pediatrics, for example, which is largely female. Um, and it's interesting that radiology is different because that really is kind of, you know, kind of equal there. Um, I think that the, the question is, why are those fields um, attracting um, more males than females? And why are some fields attracting more females? It has to do with the, the promotion 
uh, and if you have a, a large number of males to begin with in that field, like you know orthopedics, for example, or thoracic surgery, it's just so much harder for a female to break in because you've got that kind of almost men's club mentality. It's all these biases that I talked about um, that that are present, and so. Um, you have to make it more equitable by having more females on the recruiting end of it uh, and on the mentorship end of it so that more females come into the field that are predominantly male and it starts changing over the system. If you just have one or two females even coming into the recruiting end of it, it will make a large difference in, in the recruitability in that field. And similarly, um, for fields that are predominantly um, female in, in nature, they tend to be lower compensation. So you just have to, we have to just have a, a system where that becomes more palatable uh, for males, uh, male physicians. And, uh, you know, improved compensation is certainly one thing, making it more, if we make it more gender equitable, uh, then the compensation will increase. Thank you. No, I, I know that uh, we've recorded this, so I think there was some part of which my slides disappeared. I see a chat with that. I, I couldn't tell where, where that happened or because I had sent them over, so I'm not sure what, what happened where the slides got uh, ended. I'm not sure where, what at what point that happened, but I think they're going to all be available on the uh, uh, library, I guess, that uh, the committee has. Is that correct? Yes, and I can go ahead and send them out um, okay. separately as well. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. You're welcome. I mean, I think this is a great, important topic. You know, I think that at OSU, we've made some strides, but clearly have a way to go. Um, there's still inequity in compensation. There's still not a whole lot of transparency. I mean, there's some because of it's a public institution, but not entirely. Uh, and, you know, I think just increasing the number of uh, of making it more equitable on on promotion boards, on on uh, recruiting end of it, uh, when when um, folks are, are being recruited, that there's at least an equitable number for gender and also minority uh, candidates. I, I think that's really going to be the key, and having just transparency. Hopefully, we'll change the system. I mean, I have seen changes happen over the you know, the decades that I've been in my career, but it's, it is slow. It's slow to happen. So. Are there any other questions for me? Thank you, thank you, and thank you, Dr. Duncan, for inviting me to give this talk. And um, I hope uh, I hope it has been informative for folks. I hope uh, you've gotten some information that you didn't have before, and hopefully uh, make some progress as we as we move forward in in uh, improving you know gender uh, equity here at Ohio State and and broadly. So, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.